Well, thanks for inviting me. Thanks to the School of Law and Queen's University and Peter and Dol Dolores and the people who made me come here. Really appreciate it. My, my first time in Belfast. Um, and I, I like it. I don't say that to, uh, to start on a good foot with you. It's a really nice city. I'm really surprised. Or maybe I shouldn't have been. <laughs> but, you know, with all the background that we have when I was young, Belfast wasn't spoken in a, in a nice way. <laughs> okay, so um, I'm going to start with some examples because examples are much more telling than a, you know, kind of a theoretical treatise. And I give you three examples to show you that something is changing. Uh, the first example is something I discovered in Rio de Janeiro in, in Brazil, and it's called Curto Café. Curto is, you know, like the name for strong coffee, right? So about 15 years ago, there was an executive of a classic uh, coffee company who became very distraught about how things were going. First of all, you couldn't drink good coffee. They had four categories, A, B, C, D. A and B goes to Europe and the United States, and they stuck with C and D. So they make the best coffee in the world, but they can't drink it. Second thing is that the people who produce the coffee are very, very, very poor. And as soon as there are crises in the coffee price, they're under the poverty limit, they're, they're hungry. Um, so clearly something is not working uh, well. So, you know, there would be a period where you would say, you know, let's have, a, let's have a fair trade company or something, but something different happened here. Let me explain to you how this works. So his first decision was that, um, Certification is too expensive. If you work with really poor producers, you know, the investment that you need to go to certification, even fair trade certification, is really very expensive and beyond their ability. So you replace it with transparency, open supply chain, and open book accounting. So if you want to know, you know what coffee you're drinking, you just go online and you can see where the coffee comes from, how much they paid for it, even the names of the persons who actually, uh, you know, uh, took the coffee from the tree. Second thing is they created a commons for recipes. So they had four blends when I was there, and uh, basically these brands are brands, no blends, sorry. These blends are not privatized, they're not like secret recipes that only the company knows. They're online and everybody can you know, take that information, buy those particular kinds of coffee, try out different blends and then put it online as well. So there is a knowledge sharing going on in this whole community um, that makes that coffee. The third thing is maybe even more original. They had no money, so what do you do? Well, what they did was crowdfunded retail expansion. So basically they used Facebook and they asked their community, do you want to drink good coffee in your neighborhood? Yes, well if yes, send us 50 euro and if we have 30,000 euro we can rent this place for the next three years. The people who contribute to this fundraising get to drink free coffee for the next three years. The others will pay for it. Fourth thing they did is a bit illegal, but very interesting. They took the existing coffee machines and they hacked them so that they can change themselves these little, you know, very expensive uh, coffee uh, things and you can replace them with their coffee. So I'm sure you're starting to realize that this is very, very different from how we've seen you know, coffee making until now, right? This is really something original that just doesn't fit the current models. Is it a company? No. Is it a community? Yes, in some ways. But it's really a hybrid and it's not about making money with coffee. It's about making good coffee without exploiting people and creating a livelihood around this purpose. That's what they're doing. And using all the new affordances of technology to reorganize everything from the ground up. You know, follow kind of a network logic. 
of transparency, connection, community in a way that hadn't been done before. Let me give you a second example. This is in France. It's called L'Atelier Paysan, the Farmers Workshop. And it's just one example. There's Farm Hack in the United States, the Slow Tools Project, Open Source Ecology. There's more like that. So what are they doing? Well, today, if you're a farmer, uh, this is true in the US, and you buy a tractor, you can't repair your tractor because it's actually a software contract. It says, you know, this is our intellectual property and you are not allowed to touch and change it. So farmers are being disempowered to repair their own machines. They're making dependent uh, on these companies that make these uh, machines, which are of course hugely expensive for the same reason, because they have a monopoly on that intellectual property. Uh, moreover, I think these agribusiness companies are not very interested in making machines for ecological farmers. So what are they doing? Well, every other week in France, there's a workshop somewhere. So assume you're a farmer and you need a machine and it costs 15,000 euros to buy it. I should say pounds here, right? Um, and you can't afford it. What do you do? Well, what they do is, you pay 1,000 euro for the workshop. With your colleagues, you're making that machine. At the end of the week, you have your machine for 1,000 euro. All the designs are put online. All the films of the making of the machine are put online. So that the next workshop doesn't start from zero, but starts from that accumulated knowledge that has been uh, learned by the first workshop. Um, these people today have thousands of machines. I don't, I'm not sure about the de Paysan, but for example, if you look at Farmhack, you will see that thousands of designs. One I'm a bit proud of because I'm Belgian. Um, it's horizontal, a horizontal bike. So you lay down, face down, you push it with your feet, and you put, plant the seeds in a very comfortable position without having to break your back. No company would even design that. So I'm just saying this to show you that when you design in a community, you design already very differently than if you design as a company, right? Okay, last example. And Spiral. This is a New Zealand coalition of ethical entrepreneurs. Their tagline is, we want to do stuff that matters. Stuff that has meaning and that makes the world a better place, that solves social problems. So what they do is basically they created some kind of guilt. It's the best way to call it, a neo-medieval guilt. First of all, they're a community. They're helping each other out. Every entrepreneur has difficult times, not just financially, but morally. So they help each other out. They, if you go to a downturn, the whole community is there to make sure you, get, you go through it. The second thing they do is they're mutualizing all kinds of things. For example, they work around a open source software called Lumio, which we are using in the P2P Foundation, which is an open source software for democratic decision making. And so they're working on this together. Everybody's funding and working on this software together. That's kind of the core that organizes them. They organize around this software commons. Then they have something called co-budget, which is a software to reinvest surpluses into the community. So basically, every entrepreneur gives 5% of his income or something like that to this co-budget function. It's your money, you keep it. But the engagement is to reinvest it in projects of your uh, entrepreneurial coalition. So if you have any project and you're a member of Inspiro, you can put it forward and say, I need as much Euro to New Zealand dollars to do this. Um, again, is that a company? Not really. It's something different, right? All these things that I mentioned to you are not classical companies using labor and creating commodities. They're quite something different. And so something is happening. Now there's something we can give it different names, but the name that some people uh, use and which I use is commons-based peer production. 
And I consider this a post-capitalist way of producing and distributing value. Why? Well, normally you think of labor as a commodity. I need to sell my labor in order to survive and buy food and shelter. And my work is organized by a company which pays me and then sell my products that we make together, sells it to the market and gets a surplus. Here we have something different. We have open systems that are based on free contributions. Not free as in free beer, but free as in I want to do this, as in free choice, right? So basically, the core of this new way of thinking about value is to create a community of contributors. So you create an open system like Wikipedia, like Linux, the operating system free software, like Arduino open hardware, like the Wikispeed open source car, like the Ardesat, the open source satellite. So you create a commons and you have a community of contributors, paid or unpaid, who are collectively creating value. So paid, why paid? Well, imagine you're a company and you can afford 50 researchers. And imagine you're competing with a coalition that has a joint commons and they have 5,000 researchers. Who is going to be more competitive? Right? So why is IBM joining the Linux commons? Because by doing that, they save 90% of their internal investment. They mutualize the development of this software and by paying 2,000 people, they have access to the work of 20,000 people. So even from a purely for-profit basis, this is really interesting, right? So what we get here is the second step. You have a community of contributors and you have an entrepreneurial coalition. Entrepreneurs who co-create the commons with that community. And of course, they may be the same people. Why unpaid? Well, if you have a closed system like Microsoft, you don't have access to the code, so if you have a problem, there's nothing you can do about it. If you have an open system like Linux, and you need something more that's not there, you can do it yourself. So, 25% of the people in Linux are not paid. But not because they're exploited, because it's an open system that they, they want to participate in order to solve their issues. Um, there's also a third aspect to this, which uh, what we see is that they create foundations and they're called FLOSS Foundations, Free Libre Open Source Software Foundations. And they're very different from what we know as NGOs. So let me try to explain this uh, by using a polarity of scarcity versus abundance. What does a classic NGO do and how do they think? Well, they think there's a problem and they think they need resources to solve that problem. So they compete for resources from grants and subsidies and fundraising, and then they direct the resources to the problem. Makes a lot of sense, but if you think about what, you know, what it is, it's actually a way of thinking in terms of scarcity. Now think about what the Wikimedia Foundation does, or the Linux Foundation, or the Arduino Foundation. That's not at all the way they think. Here's how they think. There is a problem and there is enough people in the world who want to solve that problem. So we're going to create a cooperative platform, a collaborative platform that allows people to contribute to solving this issue. And they maintain that infrastructure, they protect it, they fund it, but they do not direct the labor, right? They just empower and enable this contributory system to emerge around this issue. Now, you, you may be thinking, you know, these are all like weird things that don't matter really that much in our mainstream society, but let me give you an example. There is a study called the Fair Use Economy Report. It's already from 2011, there were two of them, that calculates that the economic value created by shared resources is one-sixth of GDP in the United States and involves 17 million workers. Why would that be? I'll give you an example about geogra geography. In Europe, we think the following. 
the state invests in creating this geographical information. Therefore, we should have regained that money back. So we're going to auction two or three licenses in each country. And guess what? It's a very small economy. With two or three companies dominating each national market, hiring a few hundred people, and that's it. Now look to the US, this very arch capitalistic country. What do they do? Well, very weirdly, they, they liberated their geographical information. They said, this geographical information is a commons. It's available to all citizens, all entrepreneurs, all public officials to use and reuse and improve. So in the US, not only, uh, paradoxically, the market is much bigger than in Europe. I, I read somewhere 400,000 people make a living through geolocation applications and associated services. Um, so a commons, it, even though it decommodifies, so it's not a commodity in its core, it's not a capitalist logic of labor creating communities, but contributors creating commons, actually creates, can create a vibrant economy around it because there's all kinds of added value that are needed to make it work. So you have software and the software is free because people can just download it so they won't pay for it. But you need training, you need certification, you need legal service, you need maintenance, you need installation. There's so many things that you actually need to do to make it work. And those things are scarce, so they are market uh, activities. Um, so this is the structure of this new you know, economy of the commons. This is only part of it, because of course, so when I talk about peer-to-peer, -peer, this is what I mean. So an open system in which people can freely contribute as peers, connect with each other, self-organize around common value creation, the creation of commons. Of course, you all know another form of peer-to-peer, -peer, which is peer-to-peer -peer exchange systems. Think about Airbnb, think about Uber, right? What, what do they do? They enable individuals to connect with each other and sell each other you know, apartments or rides or whatever it is they do, right? So this is a bit different. Now, here we have, I think, an economic issue. And the question is the following. What is the most appropriate economic form for these commons-oriented uh, activities? And I'm a bit critical of, the tradi of these uh, traditional uh, models. Think a bit about Facebook as an extreme example. What would be the value of Facebook if nobody was there? Zero. You agree with me, probably, right? So, it's our interaction, our communication, our data, our attention that co-creates value for Facebook. But Facebook has a monopoly on the monetizing of that value. And how much do they reinvest in the livelihoods of the people who are co-creating the value? Zero percent. Now this is something I call the value crisis and it's really a serious issue. Here is the, here's the thesis. We are now able, technically, technologically, to exponentially increase use value creation through self-organized communities. This is happening. It's happening on a big scale. There is a Dutch study, you can find in a little book called Homo Corporans from Tina de Moor, which shows that since, two, since 2005, there is an exponential rise in non-state and non-corporate initiatives. So this is not minor, this is not marginal, this is really happening everywhere. And to give you an idea, I, you know, I've seen this in cities like uh, Berlin, Amsterdam, Paris. If you start mapping these things, you know, with these little arrows that appear on the map, you can't see the cities anymore. There's so many initiatives in every street, at all levels of society, where people are reorganizing aspects of their life in these, in these ways. Now, I lost my thread a little bit, uh, but okay, so I go back to the economic issue. 
So we have an exponential rise in the creation of use value, but only a linear rise in the monetization of that value creation. So the gap is getting bigger and bigger. And if you then monopolize the profits on this monetization without reinvesting it in the people who create the value, we are having a big issue here, right? So more and more people are precarious. And one of the reasons, I believe, is this. More and more people are doing free labor. And they're not getting paid for that free labor. And think about the logic of these companies. What does Google produce? Nothing. We produce the documents and they let us search for it. What does YouTube produce? Nothing. We produce the videos and they let us watch it. What does Facebook produce? Nothing. I'm exaggerating a little bit. You know, they are actually created platforms. But if you look at their numbers of staff, it's, they're very small companies actually, right? What, what does Uber produce? Does it build cars? No. It connects us to each other when we already have cars. What does Airbnb produce? Does it produce housing and hospitality infrastructures? No. It allows us to connect to each other if we already have. So do you see where I'm getting at? We're getting to a new system where capital becomes parasitical, where the value is more and more created by civil society, and these companies are not producing anymore. They're letting us produce, and they're capturing value on the human co based on our human cooperation. I think this is an issue. So is there something we can do about it? Personally, I favor something I call open cooperativism, which means that the people who create this value together, free software developers, open designers, engineers, architects, create their own vehicles, like in Spiral, and therefore they keep the value stream within the commons production. And they can invest in their own livelihoods and reinvest in the growth of the community and its systems. Um, let me just give an example of this because I find it's quite fascinating. There's a new book that came out in French and it has English words in it so you understand what it is. Peer to peer, poor to poor. You may have seen this. You may have seen these Indian guys that play pan flute music and sell llama wool, right? They're available, present, in most European cities with more than 40,000 people. They represent, they generate one-third of the GDP of Otavalo province in Ecuador. One-third of GDP. They're another company. They're, what are they? What they are is a business ecosystem that creates value for their community. It's not a classic enterprise. You also probably saw African people selling um, glasses and Prada bags and all the kinds of things on the beaches maybe. I don't know if there are beaches here, but maybe you have them. Um, they are a Sufi brotherhood from Senegal. Again, it's not a company, it's, we, I call it a file, a business ecosystem that generates economic livelihoods around the community. And that's what Inspiral is. Inspiral is a file, a coalition of entrepreneurs creating value for their community. Right? So this is an interesting model and in that book it shows the scale of it because for example there's a whole underground economy of trans migrants and these are people who come here but they don't stay here. They stay here for six months and they import electronics from China to the poor communities in Europe. It's a huge underground economy. And they use the internet to organize themselves to know what people need and to indicate where they will be at what time in which city. Okay, so the econ economic issue is how do we keep value within? And uh, we move from extractive forms of capital to generative forms of capital. Forms of capital that co-create value with the community and with the commons. 
Okay, now maybe we also have a political issue. If you think about what I just explained to you, which is the microeconomy of peer-to-peer, and think about it as a social system, as a political system. So here is our society today. We believe value is created in the private sector. Workers selling their labor, companies organizing the labor and the value creation, and paying the workers. Now, in a market relation, you do not look at the externalities, right? You not, you, what I'm interested in is equivalent exchange. I want to sell a product and get the value for that product. So we have a state that from the outside regulates the market because it wouldn't do it from its own. But what about civil society? Well, if you look at civil society, look at the words we use. Non-profits, non-governmental, what does that mean? That means that we think the core of our society is either business or government. And civil society is what we do when we go home tired after work. That's really what we're saying and what actually we're doing. Now look at this new system that I'm describing and try to project that on a national scale, for example. But what I'm saying is that civil society today is productive. Citizens are self-organizing and creating value around commons, around shared commons. So this is the first thing. So we, we, we move from a vision of a passive civil society that's marginal to the system to a vision of civil society that is productive, where actually the value is created through these contributions and interactions. The second thing I told you was the ethical entrepreneurial coalition. Now, if a company wants to work with a community like that, it has to adapt. So what it means in a way is that you have to internalize the externalities, right? So externalities are the things that you normally don't look at. The system, the market system by itself, doesn't care that it creates more poverty, doesn't care that it's destroying the environment. But if you work with a community, you have to take into account the social norms of the community. So what I'm saying is the following. We transform an extractive market vision into a generative market vision, into forms of entrepreneurship that co-create value with these communities, that invest in the commons to make it stronger, to grow it, and they don't enclose it. They don't only capture value, they reinvest value. But what about government? This may be the most interesting. Let me give you an example. Okay, so the Floss Foundations, I told you, they do not manage and command the production in this new system, but they enable it and empower it, right? So here's what they're doing in Bologna. Bologna is fully committed to be a commons-based city. And they have a project it's called Co-Bologna with four labs in which they're reimagining the city policies. And about two years ago, they instituted the Bologna regulation for the care and regeneration of the urban commons. What do they do? Any citizen group in any neighborhood can propose improvements to the neighborhood. There is an evaluation process, and then there is a nego negotiation between the city and the citizen groups about how to enable and help and assist these projects. In one year, 30 projects were approved, and when I was there last year, 100 projects in the pipeline. This system is now being taken over by two dozen other Italian cities. And I personally visited Comantova, which is a city in the north, which is doing pretty much the same thing. So think about it, what does that mean? Well, it means we're moving to a new vision of the state. The old vision is, I'm an elected public official, so I'm going to do things for you. I'm going to organize public services in a bureaucratic and hierarchical way, because I've been elected democratically, 
and you citizens, you can enjoy these services, right? But think about it, it's a passive model, right? The citizen is a consumer of public services. In Bologna, it's no longer that way. The state has become a partner state. It has become an enabler of the autonomy of the citizens of the city, right? So this is a vision of the partner state uh, in which you start seeing public services as co-produced by the citizens. Uh, we personally, we talk about, uh, when I say personally, I speak as a collective a bit, about public commons partnerships, public social partnerships, public social private partnerships. We talk about the commonification of public services. Starting to look at public services as a commons, rather than as a service, as a commodity that is given out. Um, okay. So, um, Peter and his colleagues are working here around the notion of well-being. So I want to say a few things about, you know, the spiritual side of all of this, right? The kind of psychological, um, if you like, issue. Um, let me give you a little reading of 1968. What happened in 1968? I was 10, but I was a bit premature. In 68, there were two revolts. One, the workers, 10 million workers on strike in France alone. Two, the students, rioting in the city, as you, some of you may remember. So what did we do? Well, basically we said to the students, fine, you'll have your rock and roll. You can call your boss by his first name, right? So we made a compromise and our culture changed. What did we say to the workers, the young workers who no longer wanted to work in the Fordist system, in the, ch you know, the chains that were the tailorist uh, production work? What did we say to them? Well, what we told them was, thank you, but you know, from now on we'll produce in the Global South. Right? So the decision was made, at the, and this is, you can read about this, so the advice of Ronald Reagan talk openly about this. The decision was made consciously to de-industrialize the West. And it's exactly what happened. But so, what happened in 68 was an exodus, if you like, from young workers from the system that ex they no longer wanted to work in the system. What is happening today? Well, one of the things I believe that happened is that the democratic parenting that was born in the, 68, in the 60s generation, so seeing your child as a person, with its own uh, personality, with its right to determine its own life, has created a generation that is able to collaborate. We didn't. We were antagonistic, we fought against hierarchy, but we didn't have the skills. Today you can go in any fab lab, co-working space, hacker space, open space camp, bar camp, unconference, and you will see for yourself that it's very easy for this generation to collaborate. So there was, there is a, the Edelman Trust Barometer showed that the trust in institutions in 2003 was 70% institutions and 30% people like us. In 2007, it was 30% for the institutions and 70% for people like us. So in other words, the peer-to-peer -peer cultural revolution has already taken place. It's not something coming, it has already taken place. And in my view, it has been nurtured by this new form of education that we instituted in the 60s. Um, but today we have a new problem. You're all familiar with the notion of precarity, right? The, the fastest growing group in the European uh, society is the precarious worker. Bottom up, people who clean, but also cognitive workers. But it's not just a forced precarity. Part of it is, but you will meet a lot of young people who are leaving the system, who are refusing subordinate work. They want to be autonomous and that's why they want to be social entrepreneurs. They want to do things that matter, like in Spiral. 
There was a, an interesting survey in Finland at Aalto University with, studa, with uh, design students. Here's what came out of it. 95% of the students want to do something about sustainability. They don't trust the governments and they don't trust businesses to do this. And here's what happens when they find a job. They want to design for sustainability and they have to design for planned obsolescence. So they cannot realize their dreams and aspirations within the system. It's impossible. So what do you do? Well, you become a social entrepreneur. You design for sustainability and because you have no capital, you associate yourself with open design communities. So that's what we're doing. There is today also a revolt of young people, an exodus from the corporate world, from, from the subordination of labor into a strong desire for autonomy and for meaningful activities. And they can do it within the system. So they look outside and they are reinventing entrepreneurship and other things. Um, contributions. So, 20 years ago you meet somebody on the street and what do you ask? Well, there's a big chance you ask, what is your job? Right? And you would say, I'm an engineer with Microsoft. Okay. What would you say today? Well, I can assure you, a lot of young people will answer you, I work with Linux, I work with Arduino. In other words, they see their identity not to their role in a corporation, but to their contributions to these types of communities. They're building a subjectivity, reputation, social capital, symbolic capital, through their engagements, through their contributions. This is, I think, also an interesting change. And it's interesting to see that there's a new view of man and woman, of the human, uh, in peer production. You're probably familiar with the law of equivalent exchange, right? It's what dri drives goods. So every product has a price and we compare it to some kind of abstract value uh, scheme. But to be honest, we do that with people as well, right? If you have a PhD or a master's or whatever, we are comparing people according to an external um, criteria. In other words, we apply the law of equivalence to people just as much as we do with goods. Peer production changes that. We call it equipotentiality. What does it mean? It means that we don't judge and rank people as a person compared to another person. What we say is the following. You are better than another person in this particular capacity and another person is better than you in that other capacity. So let's build an open system that allows you to freely give your skills and energy and capacity to a common project. And we call this system Stigmergy, the language of the ants. So if you think about the Wikipedia and Linux, how it works, it's a signaling system. It's like playing soccer. You have a vision of the whole field and you can adapt your behavior by seeing everyone, right? And it doesn't require you to be good persons. It's motivation agnostic. Let me explain that quickly. The problem with neoliberalism is that we only recognize one motivation, private gain. And I'm not denying it's very important, it's there in many people. But we have other things, right? Maybe we love our family. Are you selling your services as a parent to your children? Probably not. You probably do volunteering. It's very strong here in Belfast. So you're giving freely to your community. Maybe you're patriotic. You're giving freely to your country. So we know that we have various amounts of motivations. And the thing is, in peer production, it doesn't matter what your motivation is because we design for a convergence between individual and collective. So no matter why you contribute to Wikipedia, you're still creating a collective universal encyclopedia that can be used by everyone. Right? So this, I think it's also an important change. Passion. This is really related to, I think, well-being. 
I've read several studies that in general show that maybe one out of five people are happy with their jobs. It's very low. You know, I've been 30 years in a corporation, so I, it sounds actually optimistic. Uh, but okay, let's assume it's true. And you know, the test would be how many people would still do that work if you weren't paid, right? How many people would work for Monsanto and British Petroleum if they were not paid? I don't know if I'm on thin ice here, but I would guess not so many, right? Now ask yourself, how many people get paid for the Wikipedia? And the answer is none, or maybe just a few. And how many people would leave when they don't get paid? Well, none, because none get paid. So, so this is a system that's based on passion on internal, intrinsic motivation, whatever that is for you. So, believe me or not, but I'm sure you believe me, if you work from your own free will, you follow your passion, the chances of well-being are dramatically increased. Right? I'm doing what I want, I'm doing something meaningful, I'm doing it with the community, I'm recognized by the community for my contributions. This is a recipe for happiness. So imagine we can reorganize our economy that way, that we allow people to freely engage in these contributory ways, we create an economy around it, and my guess is a lot more people would be happy with what they're doing, because they will have chosen their passionate activity by themselves. Um, another thing. One of, one of the things with capitalism has been this kind of dualism between mind and body, worker and engineer, worker and manager, right? So you have some people that study in these places, like here, and they learn how to direct and manage. And then you hire people, and they do what they're being taught, more or less. Now, let's move to the fab labs and the co-working spaces and the maker spaces. What do you see? You see people who design what they make, right? So the fabbers, the hackers, are changing this duality. We are going back to a crafts ethos, where the same people think, design, and make. I think this is also very important. Now, how much time do I have? Because I can take for hours. It's finished already? All right, let me t say two more things. Let me then try to remember what those things were. Okay, I forgot one of them. So, I learned with a historical analogy. So, I believe we are in the midst of a civic renaissance. Everywhere. So, we, we can see it, right? Our systems are blocked. I know this is true in Belfast and Northern Ireland, but don't believe you're the only ones. Go to Spain, go to Greece, go to many countries, and you will see a political blockage. The system no longer functions. The democracy has been undermined, it's no longer functioning very well. Um, and so, people are reacting, and the first thing I noticed here in Belfast was the number of conversations going on. So Peter brought me to several communities, and people are talking. Well, I've already experienced this. I went to Melbourne five years ago and people were talking. And I had three lectures in, three, in 10 days. Wonderful. I could relax. Then I went two years ago and the same people were doing it. And I had 20 lectures in 10 days. And everybody that was listening to me was doing. So I think Belfast is just slightly behind the curve. But I think it's happening here because people are questioning they're reimagining what they should be doing, and very soon some of you will actually start doing things. Um, I want to give you, this is the end, Peter, don't worry. Okay, a fantastic book I read, The First European Revolution, 975, 1025. The revolution that created feudalism. How does it work when societies really change? Well, at some point, the system no longer works. It's creating more inequality, like today, for example, and it doesn't solve the climate crisis and the ecological crisis. Um, if we take the Roman Empire, 
the, the cost of expansion became higher than the benefits of expansion, so they stopped growing. No more slaves, no more gold from outside. So the system starts stagnating first and then declining. So what do you do? Well, you look for solutions, right? Both at the higher level and at the bottom, people start to look for solutions. And these solutions are, by definition, not the old solutions, because the old system is not working. So what you have is emerging patterns. And what you also have is an exodus. Slaves became serfs. Serfs became labor. Labor becomes precarious knowledge workers who are commoning. Yeah? So we have a crisis and we have people looking for solutions and creating patterns. And then slowly these patterns converge. You have the printing press, you have the purgatory, you have the invention of accounting, and 200 years later you have capitalism, right? These patterns found each other. Today we have crowdfunding, distributed manufacturing. These things are finding each other. So what I'm saying, what I'm trying to convince you of, is that these seeds that I'm describing are actually seeds of a new society, a new civilization. That sounds like a good ending but I somehow feel I had to say something more. Okay, I'll leave it there. Thank you.